the key factors in slowing it down. You know, I can give you a word that will almost answer all questions. But let me tell you a little story about that word. It was a long time ago when there were pharaohs and sultans around and I mean, thousands of years ago, as the tale goes. And the sultan of this particular country got all of his wise men together. And he said, I want all of the wisdom of the world, all the knowledge, and I want it in one set of volumes. And they said, well, we can do that. And they got all the knowledge of the world, and they put it into 10 volumes. And the sultan died. It took a long time. And his son said, you know something? I don't have time to read 10 volumes. Cut it down to one volume. Said, well, you can't do that. You know, it's all the world's knowledge. He says, cut it down or you'll cut you down. Okay? So he cuts it down. and Now he's got one volume. That took a long time. He died. His son said, I don't have time to read a whole volume. Let's get it down into one chapter. All the world's knowledge in one chapter. One chapter. Well, we'll give it a shot. And they did. They got all the world's knowledge in one chapter. And he said, you know, that chapter's too long. Can you do it in one page? All the world's knowledge in one page? I don't think we can do that. You better do it. I'm the sultan. He says, okay, we'll do it. And they did. They put it down to a page. Then a paragraph. They had all the world's knowledge in one paragraph, and he died. And then the son, the great-great-grandson of the guy that wanted the 10 volumes came in. He says, too much. I don't have time to read a paragraph. We're starting a war. He said, I want all the world's knowledge in one word. And they worked on it and worked on it and worked on it, and then the war came. And they did it. They had all the world's knowledge and wisdom in one word. But the war came, and the word was lost. Well, I found the word. And the word to answer your question is attitude. Attitude. That's what keeps a person young. That's what keeps them healthy. That's what stimulates them to creativity and to do and to be happy. Attitude is everything. If you ask me what would be the one thing that would cause the loss of life early, it is the inability to handle emotions. Because the emotion is like the top computer. It makes a determination about where we're going to put energy and how much we're going to put there. If we are living in fear of the future and guilt of the past, and we're not present, we undergo what I call entropy in our physiology, and we accelerate the aging process. So emotions of extreme natures, without a doubt, age us. When we're really, really in a state of grace, gratitude, poise, present, love, uh, a deep inspiration and appreciation for who we are and the universe we get to participate in, we, without a doubt, slow down the aging process. Well, I think the most common thing that everyone is suffering from that is accelerating the aging process in a dramatic way for almost everyone is these trapped emotional energies that are inhabiting all of our bodies. They will create disease. Every disease process that I have seen in practice in 22 years has had these trapped emotional energies as either a contributing factor or sometimes as the only reason for these conditions. I'd say the primary factor in slowing down and reversing the aging process is actually getting over our points of view and our judgments that are creating the constriction in our bodies and in our lives. You know, we've all seen 90 year old people who seem to just be moving throughout the world and their bodies are moving and they have a sense of fluidity and ease. They have a sense of fluidity and ease in their life because that's for whatever reason, that's the point of view they chose and adopted as they went throughout their world. One of the things that I found in the work that I've done with people is that, and, and science actually validated this, is that any time you have a thought, a feeling, an emotion, what it does is the, the cell should have a spherical structure and the energetics around the cell should be a spherical structure. So it can receive and gift energy from all directions. Anytime you have a thought, a feeling, or an emotion, it actually intersects that and turns it into an elliptical structure, which then is out of balance. 
And science tells us that's the beginning of the basis of disease. The secret is to not look for results, not try, not create a great deal of effort to live a long time. We need to focus not on living long, but living right, living full. The quality of life must be full. To give your life, but not as a martyr, but to give your life to serve, to help the planet. To me, that keeps you young forever. Yogananda essentially t let me understand that you can accomplish anything you believe in. So the most important thing is to believe. And once you believe, it is. So if you look at then <clears throat> human beings who are living by the same emotion every single day, they're exposing themselves to the same environmental condition because thoughts are the language of the brain and feelings are the language of the body. The body's being signaled by the same genetic expression. And as if you, if you keep pushing the same genetic button, the gene begins to wear out, just like gears on the car. The be gene begins to break down. So if you look at aging then, we could say then, what happens when you age? What happens to most people when they age? What happens to their skin? It wrinkles. It sags. That's protein. What happens to their hair? It thins. What happens to their muscles? They atrophy. What happens to their joints? They get stiff. These are all expressions of protein. So the expression of protein is literally the expression of life. And so as the body begins to be exposed to the same emotion, and it pushes the same genetic button, the body begins to make a cheaper protein. And because of that, the body begins to break down. So 90%, according to the psychological model, of most people, emotions are negative. And when we can look at that, what it really means is those emotions of survival endorse the ego to create the emotions of anger and aggression, of hatred, of judgment, of fear, of anxiety, of hopelessness, of powerlessness, of depression. Those emotions that most people call normal, those are the direct result of those, those stress response uh, hormones. And so as the person lives by those limited emotions over and over again and it keeps pushing the genetic button, it begins to break the body down. That's when aging begins to become accelerated. The question of age is then really not built into the genetics. It's built into our mind and our perceptions and our beliefs because it is through the chemistry of our mind and brain and what we believe that ultimately selects the genes and can modify the gene expression. We used to think genes were just blueprints that made things. And in fact, well, they are blueprints. What we never put into the equation is there's a contractor. The mind is a contractor that reads blueprints, and the mind can modify the blueprints. I can, by how I respond to the world around me, change every one of my genetic blueprints to create 30,000 variations of protein products from the same gene, meaning the gene is not the limitation. It's the contractor. Whatever the mind envisions, it will coordinate the genetic activity to create what the mind envisions. If the mind envisions disease as part of my life, I will manifest a disease if I believe that. If I believe I'm going to age and go through a degeneration process, then my mind will assure that process by releasing the chemistry that will manipulate the genes to manifest my vision. So basically, aging is really not part of the genes. Aging is a vision of the contractor of the mind who builds the body using the genes. Our genetics are set but they're being governed and regulated by our perceptions of the world and our beliefs about the environment that we live in. So even though we may have genetic tendencies to certain um, states of longevity or shorter life, uh, we do have epigenetic and psychological components that can, um, in a sense, override that or at least influence that. If that cycle of thinking and feeling and feeling and thinking has taken place because the person has been branded emotionally, from some experience in their life, some trauma or some event, and they think about that experience all day long. The very thought of that experience turns on the same chemistry in the brain and the body as if the event was happening. And so the person thinking about or remembering pro problems or past experiences over time, really the body thinks it's in the same environmental conditions 50 to 100 times in one day. And that redundancy, that cycle then, 
causes the body to begin to break down. The surest way to health and vitality and youthfulness is to release from the brain the chemistry that is associated with thoughts of happiness and harmony and love. These thoughts actually translate into chemistry that support our vitality and support our health. And therefore, we must learn to disconnect from the stresses of the world because those stresses are the primary cause of our disease states and our early aging. So it basically comes back to our own personal empowerment to decide what we want to perceive and what we want to think about in our world because that's our personal choice. And when we choose love and health and harmony as visions, we will actually manifest that. And that is the most important understanding. We are powerful people and we just have to recognize that it's the power of our thoughts that we are manifesting. For most people, if they're living in stress or they're living in survival, the hormones of stress, the adrenaline and the cortisones that knock the body out of homeostasis typically create a very acid environment. And that acid is almost like acid for the cells. That's what begins to break the genes in the body down. When we're, the body's in a state of alkalinity, for the most part, it's in a state of growth and repair. It's in a state where it's interested in consume, conserving energy for long-term building projects. The acidity is an excess positive charge. So we can become more alkaline and more negatively charged through touching the earth, barefoot, getting electrical connection to the ocean and bodies of water on the earth. We can also get that negative charge from high antioxidant foods and from fresh foods, which has a good negative charge. Well, what foods are those? Vegetables herbs, berries, those are the foods that make us alkaline. When people have cancer, we find that they're always in an acid state. By reversing that and bringing them back into a more alkaline state, uh, you're much better able to recover from those diseases. Alkalinization is the cornerstone of healing, whether it's from cancer or anything, other, anything else. You have to have the enzymes working in the blood and the body, and you have to have oxygen being carried through the blood. If you have just a slight shift in the pH toward acid, away from alkaline, then the ability of the blood to carry oxygen dramatically decreases. Now we can control the alkaline and acid levels in many ways. We can control it with taking the proper minerals and proper vitamins. We can control it by um, eating more alkaline-based ash foods like fruits and vegetables and whole grains. We can, uh, we can mediate it and control it by keeping the body in chemical, physical, and emotional uh, balance. Exercise is another way. Yoga, meditation, aerobic exercise, all of those things keep that alkaline acid balance uh, in order. With the caveat, of understanding that if a person is living in highly stressful conditions, they can be eating the most alkaline foods and the acidity from those hormones are still gonna override their healthy diet. It's the absolute truth. And the first basis of nutrition is water. Water before food. Why do I say water before food? Because we are a majority of water and majority rules, right? Our bodies are about 65%, more or less 5% water. And so we've given all this focus to food, important, very important, but what about water? What about the majority of what we're made of? Well, I believe that the majority of people are chronically dehydrated. When you're chronically dehydrated, what happens is your blood doesn't flow as well, your lymph doesn't work as well. Uh, you start to end up with back pain and other types of symptoms in the body. So from my point of view, nutrition plays a role, absolutely, and yet it shouldn't be considered the end-all, be-all answer. There's a lot more to us than our digestive tract, than our assimilation, than our physiology specifically. From my point of view, our psychology in the space of being that we're willing to be influences our physiology. Actually, they go back and forth, but that actually influences our physiology even more than the other way around. So rather than just a, approaching this idea that we can have eternal youth from a nutritional perspective, what if we gave it the place it deserves, which is as a part of it? And if your body needs something, 
by all means, please take it, use it, but realize that there are also these other ways of changing things that may, number one, eliminate the need for specific forms of supplementation and nutrition. I know I'm probably stepping on toes here. And at the same time, open up to the possibilities energetically that we have available. If we could live our lives a lot more like we did when we were little kids, when every day was too long and too short all at the same time, a lot more like we do when we're out in nature where we wake up and it's like, oh, it's a great day to be alive. That, from my point of view, would eliminate the necessity for a lot of things we're trying and believing we need to do now to try to undo the ravages that we're placing on our body. If you have a headache, a lot of people run down and get a headache pain pill thinking they healed something. You didn't heal anything. That pain's gonna be back because you didn't get to cause. 98% of all headaches is caused by dehydration of the fluids in the brain, the hydronium fluids. Those fluids are supposed to drain out your body and right out the front door and be replaced every 24 hours. The only way that it does that is if you drink water, not liquid. Other liquids mixed with other things go down into the small intestine, absorbed by the lactils, goes into the bloodstream and can hydrate and do other things. The brain has a blood-brain barrier. It will not allow any fluids into the brain other than water. And it lifts it from the stomach within 20 seconds of drinking water through capillary precipitation It lifts and hydrates the frontal lobes first. Then through osmotic precipitation, it'll move through the brain. As the new water's coming in, the old water's running out. You don't drink enough water, which is about two liters a day, the weight of the brain. If you're not doing that every day, over time and distance, the brain dehydrates and the capillaries have to constrict to hold on to the fluid, otherwise you could die. That hurts and we call it a headache. All you have to do, nine out of 10 times, if you have migraine headaches, other headaches, drink one liter of water and wait about 12 to 16 minutes. Headache's gone. You got to the cause. So the signal of pain goes away. Most critical element of nutrition, and most of the times it's not even given a passing word, much less placed as the headliner. Water is the headliner of nutrition. Everything else is secondary. We have to eat an anti-inflammatory diet, which basically consists of fresh fruits and vegetables. Look for lots of colors in your food. When there are colors present, it means there are antioxidants and phytonutrients. And antioxidants and phytonutrients are anti-inflammatory. I say fresh, live, whole, and organic is the best way to go. I believe that raw food must be a part of everybody's diet at some percentage, not like my diet, which is a totally raw food diet. Raw food is very simple. It's clean. You know exactly what you're getting, and therefore it leaves very few residual byproducts. And in the equation of aging, that's one aspect we want to be careful about. We do not want to toxify ourselves with carcinogens like pesticides. We do not want to toxify ourselves with carcinogens like nitrosamines and substances that are found in barbecued meat products. We don't want to toxify ourselves with, with renins and thick milk byproducts that we can't completely digest that coat our intestines because later that could cause a problem. There's always a certain amount of anything that you can get away with. Not one wave shapes the beach, but many waves shape the beach. So if you can consistently eat raw, clean, pure, organic food, it's going to work to your benefit and your longevity. And I think in general, live food makes you feel alive. And so that's why I like the raw diet, because even though you do prepare some food in your dehydrator, most of it is just live. It's just live and colorful. When you take a plant into your body, you are taking the highest concentrations of spectral frequencies of light, which is what nutrition means. Well, I think water is really important. And, you know, there's all kinds of different waters because water is just energy. And so I believe in alkaline water is the best water we can have. But water in itself is so precious. And I was just thinking the other day, in fact, how I could just turn on my faucet. I've got a, a, an alkaline system under my sink, and I have this pure water. I don't have to buy plastic bottles or anything. And there are all kinds of ways you can do this now, this a little uh, a carry-on kind of thing that you can do and put into your water that cleans your water. But just water in general, people don't respect it.
I've talked to these people who frequently live to be over 100 years old who drink this healthy water. And, and, and it's, it's more than just the water, but they do five things. I call them the five Fs. Uh, these people that live over 100 routinely, um, the five Fs in their life, first of all, is, is faith. They're all in relationship with God, so this is an important part of their longevity. Family, they're all in relationship with family. Family is a very important part of their life. They're in their family, they're participating in their family, their family's participating in their lives. So family is very intimate. So faith, family, um, function, they're all functioning. They're still functioning. They still have a reason to live. In America, we work for retirement and then we retire and then we die because we no longer have a function. So I, I talked with this sweet little lady in, in uh, Vilcabamba, Ecuador. She was 105. And until two years before, she was the local midwife. So up past 100, she was still delivering babies in her community. She had functionality. She was useful in her society. So faith, family, function, and then food, uh, eating fresh food, right, freshly picked, organic, uh, full of life, not picked green and shipped and refrigerated and uh, with all these things, no chemicals, no pesticides. So a healthy food source is really critical. And then fluid. They were drinking clean, alkaline water that had um, antioxidant properties in them. You could measure the antioxidant properties in the water. So the water that they were drinking was fresh out of the mountainside, uh, alkaline, clean, alkaline, and antioxidant properties. So if we can recreate that kind of water in our own homes, that's the kind of water we need to be drinking. So water is very incredible, critical. The most critical element of nutrition, and most of the times it's not even given a passing word, much less placed as the headliner. Water is the headliner of nutrition. After about the age of 45, our brain begins to shrink. Literally, literally, 1% a year. Our spinal cords begin to contract down. What's going on? Okay, so one of the things of brain shrinkage is we start as little children at 75%, 7, 75% water. Okay, and then if we over dehydrate, Okay, we may get down as low as 50%. I mean, we really contract. Well, your, your disc and your spine are three quarters water. If you're out of water, you literally lose, how about age 60, you lose two inches off your height. That's impressive. I'm at 69 and I am slightly taller or even to when I was when I was 20. That has about, a lot has to do with hydration. Okay, and the brain shrinkage, same thing, is, is your brain actually gets prune brain, it shrinks. I don't know, that's not so good either. But if you hydrate, your brain maintains its expansion and that's a, a, a key. And it has to be good quality water, which you know, the best is spring water, and then the, the second best is, is kind of prepared water that I talk about with either distilled or um, and activating the distilled water or RO. Got to be good water, it has to be clean of pesticides, herbicides, fluoride, chloride, radiation, all those kind of things. But good water and well hydrated is very important to the whole thing. Now the thing is, people ask me, what about the quantity of food that I eat? And this is very interesting because we know with animal experimentations that the only thing that increases the maximum lifespan of an animal is caloric restriction. If we get them, give them about 60% of what they would eat normally, ad lib diet, they actually live longer. They, they, the aging process has slowed down. We don't have that data in humans, but we do know certainly that um, having excess body fat on you is pro-inflammatory, will accelerate the aging process, and increase our risk of age-related disease. We don't know if caloric restriction works with humans, and there's no way to do good studies that won't take 100 years. But there are other things that we can do. There are certain nutritional supplements uh, like resveratrol and some others that seem to activate the same protective genes that caloric restriction does. 
So I just tell my patients, you know, eat good food, make sure that you are basically nutrient dense, and yet keep your calories down. And that's probably the best strategy. You can begin to understand that nature is complex so that we don't have to be. You can be as dumb as a sack of hammers. And if you're smart enough to eat an apple, you get the full benefit of the nutritional components of that apple. You don't have to know the 9,000 chemical names that they have studied of the phytolytic components of an apple. You don't have to know any of them. If it's a red apple, it has lycopene. That's Latin for it's red. Well, this has carotenoids. That's Latin that it's orange. Yeah, but this pill has anthocyanins. Well, so does eggplant and grapes. It means blue purple. They make up all this made up 17th century Latin to make it sound like they're scientific and authorities. We are the experts. Come and get our pills. We've got to wake up, people. We've got to just turn around and get back to being ourselves as young children and learn to play and to smile and to dance and to jump and to run and eat an apple and an orange or any other food that they're attacking you and telling you that those foods are dangerous and deadly. Here, take our pill instead. I kind of went off on pharmaceuticals, but that's the way I feel. People have got to stop it. They've got to walk away from the war on disease, lay down all the weapons of war, and come over here and learn how to embrace principles of health the way long-lived cultures that were disease-free lived. They didn't have 561,000 patented pharmaceutical drugs. They didn't even have one. They didn't even have miracle supplements in plastic bottles, in plastic capsules, and coated with aluminum fluoride. They didn't have any of that. They had air that moves, meaning it's alive and electrical. They had water that moved, that they drank from. They had sunshine, and they were not afraid of it. The sun has been the life of every living thing on this planet for thousands of years, but we're convinced through empirical evidence gained by laboratory studies that have been peer-reviewed that on July 16, 1967, the sun came up and changed its mind. It decided it wanted to kill people, especially Australians. That's what the studies show. And yet the truth and the reality behind it, which is also published in their journals, and that's what protects them in courts of law, is that the sun is the number one healing ingredient to the brain and central nervous system, to the liver, to the skin, to the circulatory system, to the functional capacities of the liver, the pancreas, the spleen, the thyroid, the sun. The problem is it's hard to make money on the sun. The chocolate is the number one antioxidant in the world of any single food. Chocolate is the best natural source of any food of magnesium, iron, chromium, phosphorus, zinc, copper, and manganese. All the minerals that are removed from our body by stress, chocolate contains. Chocolate contains the love chemicals that were identified in a famous study in 1982 called PEA, the phen phenethylamines that are in chocolate make us feel like we're falling in love. And then there's the bliss chemical, anandamide. Having said all that, the real shocker was when I came across research indicating that chocolate is the number one longevity food of all time. If you do the research and you start looking at the people who are 104, 109, 110, 115, 120, or even 122 years old, like Jeanne Calment, the French woman who lived to be 122 years old, you will find that chocolate is the most prominent food in their diets. Air and water. I'm not joking. We only get about 10% of our energy from food, and the rest comes from light and air and water. So we kind of look at the big picture. But the real message, which is very, very important message, is the less you eat, the longer you live.
it's very straightforward, and, and they've been doing research on this since 1930. Uh, Professor Clive McKay at Cornell Medical School did this thing with, I, I think it was rats, and, and it, he fed them half as much and lived twice as long. And that basic experiment is repeated again and again and again. Now, it gets better. It's, it's always nice to get better with this, okay? People uh, began seeing that in, at any age, okay, if you go and eat less, you actually live longer. First of all, meat is, uh, most of the f f meat is shot up, you know, factory farming, the meat is shot up with steroids and antibiotics. Even the people who say that we raise our grass-fed cows and this is good, I mean, a cow is going to be killed. It's, it has the fear of that. It senses the fear. And I think we ingest that, just like we ingest it when food is cooked with love. It's the same thing that we ingest when food is, has fear put into it. And I think the main thing is, is that that meat, we're not meant to digest meat. It sits in our body for like four days or something before it, it even leaves our system. And that's where cell damage starts to happen. The main thing about meat, chicken, all different kinds of fish, is that we're exposing ourselves to variables in our toxic world that we don't know about. For example, the mercury content of fish is something that we're unsure of every time we sit down to a meal. The amount of PCBs that are in the chicken is something we don't know exactly how much we're exposing ourselves to. The amount of pesticide residue like DDT that's in red meat may be high, may be low with every meal that we have. So we always want to be very, very careful about how much meat that we eat and we even may even want to become a vegetarian to avoid those unknown variables. That's the reason why I don't eat meat, I don't eat chicken, I don't eat fish, because it's too many variables, and I also have a strong heart for animals. Everybody's not like that, of course, and there are many meat eaters who've lived to be over 100, but in our toxic world today, we have to be more careful and more discerning. We always want to select organic foods, free-range animals, and we want to be very focused in as well on quality versus quantity. Being a vegetarian helps. Alcohol absence of helps. But at the same time, I read a, about a man in the newspaper who's 115 years old. Every night he had a shot of whiskey and one cigarette. He wasn't a vegetarian. So I only know for myself. I've been a veg 45 years. I haven't had alcohol or drugs for 45 years, and I'm going to be 69, and I feel great. So does food have a lot to do with it? For me, a whole lot. I can only speak for myself. I don't need anything that runs away from me or swims away from me or, or flies away from me because it would just make me feel sad. But that's not true with everybody. But if what you eat can't come out of you in elimination in 18 hours, then it turns to poison. Whole foods, plants, exercise supports that whole thing of life and youthfulness. Bodybuilders in California who have gone vegetarian and have become some of the most massive bodybuilders there are, because every plant food has all 200,000 identifiable proteins, every one of them do, just in different concentrations of different kinds. We break out 200,000 identifiable proteins, we call some hormones, some enzymes, and we give them all these different names, but every plant has that, even grass. You could live on grass. Some cultures have had to for upwards of seven to 10 years because of droughts and famines and other things that have taken place, and they eat grass. 2,000 pound ox eats nothing but grass and drinks water, and he's solid muscle and bone. Where does he get his protein? The grass has got every known protein there is. Look at a horse. If they live out in the pasture and drink water, good water, and eat grass, they're the swiftest, most powerful horses out there. Elephants do the same thing, biggest animal on the face of the earth. Gorillas, 800 pound gorilla, most strongest animal they've ever seen, and all it eats is fruit. So here we are. We're talking about youthfulness. We're talking about longevity. We're talking about functional capacities. 
when you have a plant-based diet and you support that with exercise, which vents the body, you are preventing old age. You are preventing loss of capacity. Food's secondary. Water's primary. So food, what, what do you want that to look like? Uh, what we're just sharing, you want it to be as fresh as possible. If you can have a little garden, I, I don't care if you live in the city. If you've got a flat roof, grow it on the roof. If you've got a backyard, grow it in the back, backyard. So fresh vegetables and fruit are the cornerstone of healthy, solid nutrition. And without pesticides, without chemicals, uh, so they'll be full of life, full of antioxidants, full of nutrition, healthy nutrition. And that's, that's what that looks. Vegetables, fruit, um, move away from acid-creating elements as much as possible. So the less meat we can have in our diet, probably the better off we are. If you're going to do some meat, uh, you know, cold uh, water fish are, are healthy, except that they're, you know, for the, for the uh, mercury and toxicities that we put into the water, they're pretty healthy. Still, our bodies are fairly, fairly tolerant of some small levels of some of those chemicals. Uh, if you're going to eat meat organic, again, the fresher, the better. Uh, Pesticide-free, but that's what healthy food looks like. Vegetables, fruits, and small portions of meat. The fresher, the better. Organic, if you can afford it. If not, there are other ways to clean it up from using hydrogen peroxide to acid water. And there are ways to clean contaminants off of food if you can't get organic. And it's better done that way anyway because a lot of even organic food these days is contaminated. We're getting, I think, over half of our organic food now from China. And if you've been to China, it's hard to find anything really pure there. Um, the air is not pure, the water is not pure, and so I have a lot of questions about or, organic food that you find frequently. So it's better if you buy it from a local market with people that you know that have grown it, or grow it yourself it would be the best. So water is the headliner of all nutrition, and then healthy fruits and vegetables and small portions of meat. I, I don't think it needs to be terribly complex, but uh, go green with food. Stay active. To exercise and sweat and laugh at least an hour every day. It's like a mandatory thing. It isn't like a choice or a leisure. You have to move. The body is created to move. Myself, it would be different than for you or for someone else. Um, I find I like to do uh, activities. Exercise is very important. And uh, I'll do some varied activities like uh, Tai Chi. Uh, I might go to the gym, uh, swim, rollerblade, uh, those sorts of things. I, I think you should do something you like and, and do it, you know, not as a chore, but just have fun doing it. Dancing could be another thing. Um, playing hockey. Uh, <laughs> anything, any activity like that. Um, <clears throat> but you have to balance activity with rest. And of course, getting a good night's sleep uh, is important. But here, here's a healing principle. If you want to increase your energy, you must have rest, and, and that will then give us activity. Rest is the basis for activity. My great suggestion to people is please get your body moving. Our bodies were meant to move, that's what they do. If you were to do nothing other than walk around the block three to four times every single day, that would be a bare minimum, but it would actually get the energy moving in your body continuously and consistently. Life is movement, it's movement. The less you do, the less you can do. The more you do, the more you can do. It isn't just about the food you eat, it isn't just about the yoga that you do, because it can all be self-serving. I've met people who are such fanatics about what they eat and their yoga, but all they're doing it for is themselves. This vehicle 
is to be kept in good shape like a car so that you can drive it and you can get to your destination. That's the only reason. If you're doing it just so that you won't get any wrinkles or so you'll just always look good, and that's not it. That's what comes from it, but that's not it. It's like if you had a shiny car, but the inside engine didn't work, you wouldn't get anywhere. All right, now I've said I don't exercise, and I said I eat pretty much what I want. So what is it? What's the magic? What's the key? Well, I said that in the very beginning. Attitude. Everything is attitude. Now, every organism in nature is designed for short-term stress. And when we live in stress, we live in survival. So is it, if a gazelle is, is uh, grazing in the Serengeti and it's being chased by a lion, the moment the predator-prey relationship begins, there is a, a, um, um, a reaction that caught, turns on what's called the sympathetic nervous system. And when the sympathetic nervous system is turned on, we mobilize enormous amounts of energy for some threat. Now, if the gazelle outruns the lion, 15 minutes later, it goes back to grazing. Short-term stress, body returns back to homeostasis, energy is then consumed, the, the, uh, the organism rests and repairs for growth and, and um, balance. But with human beings, it seems that we can turn on the stress response just by thought alone. And we can begin to anticipate some future event. We can begin to expect something to happen or think about and begin to plan for some worst case scenario. So the privilege of being a human being is that we can make thought more real than anything else. Then as we begin to attend to some future scenario, we can turn on the stress response just by thought alone. Now the body is the unconscious mind. It does not know the difference between some experience in the environment and some emotion that you create from an experience based on a memory by thought alone. To the body, it's exactly the same. So <clears throat> as we begin to think about our problems, as we begin to plan for the worst case scenario, as we begin to forecast and get prepared for bad news or something that may happen, the body as the unconscious mind is beginning to respond as if the event is actually happening. The key element more than anything else is that if we keep mobilizing enormous amounts of energy for some threat, real or imagined, to protect us from something in our external environment, we have very little energy in our internal environment. So cancer cells get together and now they decide to start a family and they, there's no homeland security to protect the, the, the immune system is actually weakened because the the body's actually mobilizing all of its energy for something in the external world. And what happens is there's no energy for long-term building projects. There's no energy for growth and repair because the body's living in a constant state of emergency. That means that we can turn on the stress response just by thought. That means that our thoughts are actually making us sick. So the real question is, if our thoughts can make us sick, is it possible that our thoughts can make us well? Recognize that uh, growth and protection are mutually exclusive behaviors. You can't do both at the same time. Growth is open, taking things in. Protection is closed, pushing things away. They can't both occur at the same time. The relevance about that is nature designed stress response only to be used at moments of intense need, like running away from that saber-toothed tiger, that no body can survive in a stress environment because stress is diverting the energy for protection. So in the history of human evolution, stress was only supposed to be used at the most dire moments for self-preservation. And then you look at the world that we live in today, and we live 24-7, 365 in stress. It's completely antagonistic to the evolution of health and harmony in the body, and we are paying the cost for it. The more stress people are under, the higher the medical bills are in that country, and basically because illness and stress are directly linked to one another. Well, unquestionably, meditation can play a major and significant role in longevity. Because when you're in meditation, if you're not using meditation as escapism, but you're using it as it was wisely intended to allow your mind to dissolve the brain noise and to become really present, where you now dissolve the fabric of space-time in your mind, and you're now one with the universe, you might say. In that state, meditation, in that state, you don't age. 
People who meditate typically live longer. People that um, meditate typically see life in a way that is fulfilling to them. I always say it's wiser to meditate than it ever is to medicate. And to meditate, you're dissolving the fabric of space time in your mind. And to medicate, you're adding space and time in your mind. You're aging. Every medication has side effects. And meditation, there is no side to have effects. Meditation does play a big role in slowing down aging because our bodies, uh, since they are conceived and constructed by our consciousness state, when our mind settles down to its least excited state in meditation, naturally the body begins to follow into a deep state of restfulness. And in that deep state of restfulness, the body is able to throw off accumulated stress. Stress is caused by overloads of experience that we've had throughout a lifetime that are distorted memories locked up in the cells of the body that are irrelevant to our body's functioning. And so then, as we release the stress on a daily basis, we're unlocking the body's potential to be frictionless, a little bit like taking the handbrake or emergency brake off on your car. If you've been driving around with the brake on, it's going to make the car age remarkably fast, and it'll burn a huge amount of fuel. And if you can take that brake off, then the car's performance characteristics are liberated. So like that, as you practice meditation, your body's natural youthfulness is liberated to be able to continue to perform frictionlessly for you. Meditation, yes, it's basically good. Any form of stopping and quieting yourself and paying attention to higher things is meditation. It doesn't have to be a technique. When you're meditating, you're taking your mind away from the normal four or 5,000 thoughts. I'm not making that figure up. I don't know who figures these things out, but scientifically, you're supposed to have thousands of thoughts. And you realize you're always flitting from one to another. When you're meditating, you're, meditation basically is a jumping off place, but it's totally a concentration of attention on one thing. That's why mantras are used in meditation. When you're thinking of the word Om, or whatever, could be Om, that's the universal mantra, could be anything. Could be a piece of pie, you could say a piece of pie. As long as you're concentrating on one thing, you're not concentrating on all the minutia. And so if you meditate, let's say even five minutes a day, and if you're in a, in a stressful situation, then you want to meditate maybe three or four times a day. But just to get your mind, just to get your mind relieved of the tension. Meditate, don't think about anything, just let the world go by, open up your eyes, go back to work, and you're back in shape again. I think meditation probably holds the key because it gives you the relationship to the inside of, t of you, it gives you the relationship of why you came, why you reincarnated back. It gives you all that you need to know about your destiny, about your life. If you don't have a purpose here, if you don't know why you're here, then why be here? And I think that's one of the reasons so many people leave, even early, because they have no clue why they're here. We don't have a sense of purpose. Then uh, what we have is the opposite of it, which is purposelessness. And living in purposelessness you know, almost anything goes. It means that every given moment, our entire agenda, our purpose of living is marred. So, for example, everyone is convinced that through thinking and actions and achievements, you might one day arrive at fulfillment, as if in, you know, if you achieve lots of things, you'll get to this beatific state where thoughts and desires will vanish. But in fact, we know that that's not true because we've met lots of people who've achieved lots of things who aren't yet fulfilled. So fulfillment is not out there. It's an intrinsic inner experience deep inside you. When you experience that deep inner quiet place, that supreme inner contentedness during meditation, then what happens is you found fulfillment inside you. And that fulfillment that you found inside you begins to drive your thinking, your action, and achievements. In other words, you're, you found the fulfillment and you're using thought, action, and achievement to deliver it to the outside world. And so then you really do become, uh, in the sense of purpose-driven, you're able to have a purpose 
for your thoughts, for your actions, for your achievements, which is, let me take the fulfillment I found inside me and let me deliver it to where it is not. The outside world is full of need. I'm going to find neediness outside me. I'm going to find fulfillment inside me. The rest of the world is the other way around. I'll find fulfillment outside me and in, import it in and fill up the great hole of neediness inside. When you're living by those hormones of stress, when you're living in survival, the gazelle who's being chased by the lion, when she's being chased by the lion, she's only concerned about three things when the chase is on. She's concerned about her body. She's concerned about the environment. And she's concerned about time. In other words, I have to take care of my body. This is a priority. Where in my environment am I going to run? And how much time do I have to get there? Now, when you and I are living by the hormones of stress, we obsess about our bodies. We obsess about our hairstyles or our body parts. We obsess about the things we own or we don't own. We obsess about money. We obsess about time. Because it's the very hormones of stress that are causing us to become materialists. It's causing us to overfocus on the external world. So the brainwave patterns that we're in when we're under stress are in high beta. That's when the neocortex is overanalyzing. That's when your thinking brain is, it's like it's running uh, on the freeway in first gear in your car. And when the brain is functioning on that high level, it's only concerned about the self. So we become very selfish. We become very self-indulgent, very self-important, very self-centered, self-aggrandizing, full of self-pity. It's all about the self. And the ego is endorsed to be so selfish that all it wants to do is take care of itself. And it believes that the outer world is more real than the inner world. So what do you do with those emotions? What do you do with them? They either destroy you or they uplift you. And if you can live in what we call the neutral mind, the meditative mind, then you can choose, I'm going to let that anger take me in and destroy me and probably give me cancer. Or I'm going to go back to neutral mind with a forgiving heart. Or when the love comes in, shall I receive it, embrace it, live for it? It's a choice. But if you don't first start owning your mind, then you'll just be like a roller coaster on the emotions. You'll live in a soap opera. In meditation, you come to that point where the, the frontal lobe silences the rest of the brain and your thinking slows down. You move from that high racing analytical beta state into the level of alpha or theta where brainwave activities slow down. And when that happens, when you move into alpha, the inner world is more real than the outer world. And the thoughts that you're thinking are literally the experience. You don't know the difference between either one. Your dream is as real as the outer world. When that happens and you move into that elegant state, <clears throat> you're nobody. You're no thing. You're no time. You have abandoned the ego. And when you get to that point where you're nobody, no thing, no time, you've lost track in time and space, that's the moment that true healing takes place. That's the moment when manifestations occur. That's the moment you enter the quantum field. You can't enter the field as a somebody. You have to enter as pure consciousness. You have to enter as a nobody. And when we can lay down the ego and the identity to get to that point where we are depersonalized from the environment, no longer identifying with ourself as a body with certain emotions and certain feelings, and we've detached from even the concept of linear time. The moment we can enter that state where we're pure, pure consciousness, and you get to that point where you're nothing, there's a very amazing change that takes place in brainwave patterns. All of a sudden, the brain gets very synchronous, it gets very orderly. The brainwaves become very coherent. And the moment you have that type of coherence or orderliness or synchronicity, all of a sudden different compartments of the brain that were once compartmentalized and no longer communicating with each other, all of a sudden begin to shake hands again. They begin to communicate with each other. And the brain starts to go into a more orderly pattern, which then creates a more orderly signal down the central nervous system, which then creates an orderly message to the immune system. 
to the digestive system, to the cardiovascular system. And that type of coherence we talk about begins to create those elevated emotions of love, of joy, of enthusiasm, of inspiration, of awe. That's what I call the natural state of being. There is an elephant in the living room in Western medicine, and that is trapped emotions. You see, Western medicine is using drugs and using surgery to get people out of pain and to try to help people to get well and treat diseases. But these diseases and these mental disorders, such as depression and anxiety and phobias and self-sabotage in so many ways, these things are really just the symptoms that are being caused by the emotional baggage that we are all carrying around and dragging around all of our lives. It's time for all of us to identify these emotions and get rid of these so that we can achieve a higher level of vibration, so that our diseases can fall away, and so that we can really manifest into this world the pure, perfect creation that we all have inside of us. Whenever you have emotions, you, have, you store those emotions in memories, and you store those emotions in imaginations. Imagination is of the future, memory is of the past. Whenever you have emotions stored in memories and imaginations, you're adding time to the mind. Instead of having a timeless mind, an ageless body, you have a timeful mind, an ageful body. So when you neutralize the emotions and bring balance to perceptions and aren't infatuated or resentful to things or attracted or repelled from things, and you have just gratitude for the way things are and love for the way things are, you take out time in the mind and you take out the aging process. You literally have a present mind and a timeless state of consciousness. The physiology normalizes itself in an autonomic balance and doesn't age. A timeless mind does lead to an ageless body. Being present to me means living your life perpetually in the ever-present now, the, the continuum of present moment awareness is all that's actually relevant. Our intellect is a terrible forecaster. You know, nobody one year ago was able to predict and forecast exactly what's happening today. Uh, a year ago, you might have thought you knew what you're going to be doing today, but you didn't. And that shows us and should show us that our intellect as a speculator of what's going to happen is actually a very lousy forecaster. And yet we rely on it all the time. If we had a stockbroker or a weather forecaster who had as bad a record as our intellect has in forecasting things, we'd fire that person. And yet we rely on our intellect all the time to try to forecast what's happening. Our intellect actually isn't any good at it. Your ability to actually derive the highest grade information comes from the present moment. The present moment has the entire future in the making in it. Everything that can happen is here now in seed form. The question is, can you detect those seeds? Can you tell which of those seeds is germinating and, and which ones are not? If you have the present, then you have the entire future right here in the present. When people are living inspired lives, they don't age. They're not aware of time. They can work day, all day long, and not even notice time. When you actually have more energy and vitality at the end of the day than when you started the day, that means you've been fulfilling your purpose in life and feeling inspired by your actions. In that state, you're in such a graceful resonance, such a state of presence that you don't even notice time. In that, you're most adaptable to the changing environment because you're embracing both sides of life equally, and you're not likely to be infatuated or resentful about things. You're more likely to be unconditioned. And when we're in, in that state, we're inspired, we're grateful, because we don't need to change ourselves relative to the things we're infatuated with, and we don't need to change other things relative to us that we resent. We're in a state of changelessness. And in that moment, we have the immortal mind and we have the essence of the soul guiding our lives, which is basically the love and gratitude essence, which keeps us present. In that state, we don't age. Imagine if you woke up tomorrow and had absolutely no judgment of you or anyone or anything else in any way. And imagine just for that day, no matter how hard it tried, judgment couldn't get into your universe, couldn't overtake you, couldn't make you heavy, couldn't make you unhappy. How would you feel at the end of that day? You'd actually have space and you'd have a sense of creative possibility, the likes of which the world has seldom seen. Now imagine extending that over a week 
absolutely no judgment. Now a month, now a year. Can you just imagine if that were something you were willing to choose? If you're willing to choose that, it would be one of the greatest secrets to not only prolonging your life, but actually enjoying living. To like something, enjoy it. Now, the first thing you're going to think when you hear me say that, you know, well, what, what kind of a thing is that? Of course, if I like it, I'm going to enjoy it. No, not so. You may feel guilty about it. You may have limitations in your life. You may have, 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 have sins that you feel that you've committed in your life that keep you from enjoying the things. That's key number one. What if you don't like it? If you don't like it, avoid it. Well, what if... You don't like it and you can't avoid it. Okay, if you can't avoid it and you don't like it, change it. Change it, okay? Now, what if you don't like it and you can't avoid it and you can't change it? Accept it. Accept it. If you accept it, you'll be happy. If you don't accept it, you'll be unhappy. The secret of happiness is also the secret of unhappiness. There's always a polarity. When you see one, on the opposite side is the other. Yes, I have one major one. Happiness. Joy in life. Desire to get up in the morning because you got something you want to do, not something you got to do. Something that your mind says, oh, this is going to be such fun. I don't care what it is. I don't care whether it is till in the garden. <clears throat> whether it's making clothes, whether it's building something, but it has to be a passion, you understand? It has to be the passion, something that when you do it, you forget the time. And that I can say, as long as you have that passion, and many ulcers lose it, they get up to live, not live to love and enjoy. And when we have an um, absolutely crystal clear vision, and our mind is vital, we are inspired, we don't notice time, we don't age, and we feel uh, like we're capable of doing incredible things, and we do. And we're designed to live that way. We're designed to live extraordinary lives, inspired lives, lives in the present, where we have gratitude and love for our existence and ourselves. I've asked people around the world, by the millions, uh, if you had only 24 hours to live, what would you do with your life? And when we have 24 hours, we get to highest priority. And we say, thank you, I love you, to people who've contributed to our life. So that's the essence of our existence. Thank you, I love you. Pleasure is everything. Touch, intimacy, play, dance, craft, art, anything that gives us pleasure. Music. Listen to the music you like. Don't sit there and listen to music that someone else likes. That's painful. And so... Embrace pleasure as the very foundation of your life and you will not age and lose function. As you age, you'll gain wisdom and keep the function and just be alive and vital. You'll have your second childhood starting at age 70. And it's awesome. Pleasure is everything. My feeling is that when we put an emphasis on immortality or an emphasis on living a long time, we're already losing the battle. Here's my way of looking. at it. We're all going to die. Uh, I, I hate to be so inspirational, but <laughs> we're all going to die. And, and there is a, there's a good way to do it, and then you can go kicking and screaming. Um, the people at the end of their lives who, who are ready for it are the ones who find peace and, and when they look back over their lives, it's, it's not so important that they did this or that because they're ending in peace. They're ending their life as it should be. It's, it's a courageous way to go out. If we continue to push, we get to the end of the life, we die with fear. Now, my gosh, what, what kind of a statement is that? And we, we look back over our life and we, we, we say that we were successful because we made so much money or we had a good family or a good job or whatever. But in essence, those things do really not mean that we had any quality, any happiness or joy in our life.
Yes, well, of course, I, I should say happiness. Happiness is, is relative. So when a child is born, you feel happy. When you get a raise in a job, you feel happy. But I mean stability, that inner peace. Once you have that, longevity will take care of itself. Dying will come at the right time. So why wait? Why look forward? Why create division in your mind? What you're saying is that I'm going to work towards uh, longevity is that where I am now is not good enough. If we accept where we are, we, we find there's a, there's, there's a great load that is removed from our, our shoulders. We feel at peace right here. Now, now we can turn our attention towards eating better and, and getting better rest and all of that. But if we're doing it out of fear, we create, we create a chasm in our mind that, that, that it can't be tran, uh, traversed. And we're always looking to the other side as if this utopia was over there. But I'm here to tell you, it's right here, right now. You can experience inner joy and peace without effort. Now, I mean, where are you going to go after that? I mean, <laughs> that's the name of the game. Everything else is icing on the cake. Light is the key to eternal youth. Aging is proportionate to the decrease in our natural light level. Healing, regeneration, longevity, eternal youth is the result of allowing our light to return uninhibited to its natural level. You like to do dirty dishes. Probably the answer is no. Nobody likes to wash dirty dishes. That's an attitude. Do you like a sparkling clean kitchen? Well, of course you do. Everybody likes a sparkling clean kitchen. Next time you have a sink full of dirty dishes, don't wash them. Sparkle up the kitchen. Now the dishes will be in the way, you'll have to wash them, but you're not washing dishes. You're sparkling up the kitchen. Now, the first thought that comes to your mind is, but it's the same thing. Well, how could it be the same thing if you like one and hate the other? It's not the same thing. It's an attitude.